Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. I am very excited for this conversation that we'll have. Um, we, this is uh, co-sponsored by the Center for Integration of Primary Care and Oral Health and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine um, Initiative Integrating Oral Health and Medicine. Today we will be talking about interprofessional education the devil is in the details. And we're really going to get dive deep into this topic and really talk about the quote unquote ugly of interprofessional education. So um, I'm happy to have you all here. We have an international crew and um, people with diverse backgrounds. So let's jump in and get started. So a little bit about CIPCO first. Um, our center is a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional center uh, with the Harvard School of Dental Medicine the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences University, the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and the Harvard Medical School, along with a bunch of really uh, expert individual collaborators. We are a national resource for systems levels research with a special emphasis on training enhancements that will train primary care providers to deliver care that promote, promotes oral health um, in um, addresses disparities and meets the needs of all communities. And the initiative aims to transform dentistry with innovative models of integration through education, clinical practice, outcomes, and policy. And this is a project that is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration. So let's jump in. We have a fantastic group of panelists today, so I will briefly introduce them. We have Dr. Monty McNeil. He is the Professor of Dental Medicine and Dean Emeritus from the University of Connecticut School of Dental Medicine. Thank you, Dr. McNeil, for joining us today. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Alicia Markowski. She is a clinical professor in the Department of Physical Therapy, Movement and Rehabilitation Science at Northeastern University at the Bouvet College of Health Sciences. Thank you, Dr. Markowski, for joining us today. I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. And then we have Dr. Robin Ann Harvin. She is a professor and director of health sciences programs at the Massachusetts <laughs> College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences University. She is also the chair for the Boston Interprofessional Education Leadership Group. Thank you, Dr. Harvin, for being here today. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's dive in to um, jumping into our first poll question here. Um, so have you organized personally an interprofessional education session? Um, and I will actually have my colleague, um, Christina Cassano, launch that for me. we're getting a split response, which is fantastic. And I'll share this in a moment here, get a few more responses. Wonderful, let's end that and share the results, please. We're pretty split. We've got 52% uh, who have and 48% who haven't. So uh, thank you so much. We can stop share with that. Okay. And so let's dive into this conversation with our panelists here. So um, Dr. Markowski, I wanna start with you. Um, so given that our audience actually, not everyone has organized these interprofessional educations, uh, education sessions. Could you jump into your personal story on how you've created an IPE model at Northeastern and who, what disciplines are involved? Sure. Um, in about 2018, we realized that we were not um, incorporating oral health screening into our curriculum. Um, I teach physical therapy and we teach the TMJ. 
uh, physical therapists as first contact practitioners are taught to um, do medical screening to understand you know, who to refer to or if physical therapy is appropriate. T uh, treating the TMJ, we actually didn't do any medical screening for the mouth. So we realized that we were really missing that. So um, we integrated an oral health um, simulation with an interprofessional focus. And um, we had both, at the time when I first started, we started with um, dental students, um, um, hygienists, um, students um, of hygienists as well, and, um, and physical therapists. So that was our initial um, dive into the interprofessional education. Thank you for sharing that. I know as a dentist myself, um, I would love to collaborate in the future, learning a little bit more about the TMJ. So um, anecdotally and through our research at CIFCO, we found many barriers to interprofessional education. And we'll definitely dive really deep into this topic here. But I am sure that many faculty have thought this, but maybe are a little bit too embarrassed to say it out loud. But with the mountains that you have to move to create these IPD sessions, I don't know if you're willing to admit, but is, is, have you thought, like, is it really worth it bringing, you know, all these uh, organizations, all these people together for maybe an hour session one time a year? What is that impact? And, and, and like, what are the, the real challenges that you face? And what are the, you know, the devil is in the details? It's true. I, I will admit that every year when we finish the simulation, my colleagues and I sit down and say, was it worth it? Was it worth it for the students? Did we make a difference? Was this educational time that we put um, into it really making a difference? And you know, we we looked at some research and we went back and forth. And we definitely felt that we were getting a good piece across for education. Even just the students talking when they're out on clinicals found that very few students even had this in their curriculum. So we understood the content was important, but the delivery of the content was something that we really struggled with. We um, have 100 students in our program, and um, we had one student during an oral health um, screening on a patient that we had to train, and then we had three or four observing, and then we had a, both a hygienist and a dentist observing, giving feedback, and then debriefing on these cases. It was an entire day of testing for the students to have 35 minutes of contact with us, and it probably took me a month to set it up. Um, so yeah, and, and do you know, every year I, I had different people participating. So it wasn't even that I could continue to, to keep with the same training. I will have to say Dr. Lenny Brennan has been a godsend. He has been such a pioneer, such, um, so supportive. And if it wasn't for him, I don't know if I could have been doing it for all these years. Cause he was really saying, this is important. You have to do it. This is amazing and um, kind of gave me that extra little push that I needed to put those hours in um, and, and to make those um, interprofessional sessions happen. Thank you for that. I mean, it really speaks to, and I will talk about it later, those champions that can really help and, and push things forward. But I, I really appreciate you giving the time frame. that one month is huge in, in the work that we do to prepare for a one hour session. I mean, that, that really comes down to that question of, is it worth it? Of course we know, right? We know it's worth it content-wise, but thank you for that perspective. That's, that's really helpful. Um, so I wanted to dive into just briefly into the research that we've done to show these barriers. Um, so we have found, we did research a couple of years ago to see interprofessional education in dental schools. And it was very promising to see that 96% of schools had been engaging in non-clinical and clinical IPE sessions, including uh, physical therapist students, medical students, pharmacy students, social worker. And so that's really promising. But what we found out is that uh, there is still a lot of room for improvement in evaluating these students and making sure that they're competent. I mean, most deans responded, the majority of them, said that they weren't as confident about their competence at graduation. And so, you know, while we've been making great strides in the actual content and delivery, there is a lot more in terms of evaluation that can come. We also did research in seeing um, oral health integration, the curricula into primary care training, so the opposite direction. 
And we found that the, on average, these primary care training programs, so including physician assistants and nurse practitioner programs and medical students or uh, family medicine residents, they are on average doing only zero to three hours of oral health curricula, oral health training um, throughout their, their programs. Some are as great as nine hours. There's some fantastic physical, um, physician assistant programs doing that, but some geriatric fellowship programs and family med medicine residents who may be seeing a lot of these um, issues in the, in the mouth are doing closer to zero. So a lot of room there. And as you would expect for barriers, uh, time. Time is a big thing. I mean, we're all running around doing a million things at once. And how can we find that one month, right? To, to include that one hour in the curriculum. So given those barriers, um, I wanted to jump in and talk to, um, and zoom out a little bit into a little bit more of a national discussion um, with Dr. McNeil and, and really dive into the ugly parts of IPE. So the uh, interprofessional education competencies have been introduced for about a decade now. And as, as we've had previous conversations about how the work actually started much before that. But um, you recently published a paper in, in the Frontiers in Oral Health talking about um, intent and impact and kind of a look back on interprofessional education. And one of the statements that you wrote in there was that we may be failing to graduate students who are actually more prepared to practice in integrated settings. And that's a little bit surprising because these competencies have been in there for so long. So can you tell me a little bit about more about the study and also your perspective on that conclusion? Sure, Dr. Jiang, and I'll, I'll try not to be too ugly, okay? Because um, <laughs> I think there's a, there's, there, it, there's a promising aspect to this story that 2018, I became the elected leader of our national association, uh, the American Dental Education Association. I had a few initiatives, and one was to get our membership more in tune with integrated care, promote it, and look at it from an educational perspective. So perhaps looking downstream from early IPE experiences into more of an integrated collaborative care environment. And we selected, we span, uh, scanned the country and we selected uh, uh, organizations that we thought were higher level integrated care organizations. Uh, many of them network organizations, health maintenance, um, HMO type uh, organizations that uh, had uh, higher levels of integrated care. And I wanted to learn more about how they did things. Uh, so from an educational uh, aspect, but also their pers perspectives on new graduates. Because we, as you mentioned, we've been at this for 10 years or more. So we have cohorts of graduates who are moving out into practice. And what were in the field, so to speak, what were our leaders of integrated care organizations? What were they seeing? And it was interesting. They had as many questions to me as I did to them about interprofessional education. How were we approaching it? Um, they reported, and I can, this is an imperfect study, but I think it's a small, rep, a small sample of graduates, but a rather large sample of, uh, of individuals engaged in integrated care at that level. They reported that new graduates were no less, but no more prepared for an integrated care environment. Uh, they, and interesting enough, no matter where their uh, providers, and these were dentists, DMD, DDS uh, graduates, whether they were more senior or new graduates, they all needed some retraining, some coaching, some reorientation. And in fact, there were some failures in that process where certain individuals just could not be um, a, a functioning, a high functioning individual within an integrated care environment. The two promising aspects though were this. Uh, one organization reported uh, on uh, graduates of a, of a certain school uh, that uh, uh, where the fourth and third year students spend a significant portion of their time nationally at community health centers and, and, and at centers that have integrated care environments them, to a degree themselves and um, had actually, uh, that organization was actually focusing on graduates from that uh, school, that happens to be AT still Arizona, uh, and had actually set up rotations because they felt these graduates were a bit different. So that kind of gives us some insight into perhaps some questions we're gonna look at later. The other observation by other organizations were graduates of general practice residency programs, one, one additional year uh, residency, 
uh, and especially those pr programs that had a medical focus, in a, not necessarily in a hospital environment, but a medical focus, were definitely more prepared. So it kind of asks the question, what about the 6,000 other graduates, right? Who, uh, or, or let's say 3,000 that are not taking additional training and do, do, do not have some of those community-based experiences. Uh, why are they different in a way and perhaps less prepared, even with some IPE experiences uh, in their curriculum? So, um, there were a number of suggestions about how we might address this uh, from the field. And I think we have to look at that in addition to our own inventory of, um, of, uh, of, of evidence and, uh, and analysis of our programs. Thank you for that perspective. And, and uh, let's dive a little bit right now. I think it's a good lead in. So um, you talked about these community health um, centers and that um, external rotation. Um, I know with COVID, even with our school now, we usually are on the higher end of having three months of full externship and rotating, getting that practice, that hands-on experience. Um, but we've ha had to reduce down to two months, just the reality of COVID and the pandemic. Um, and so how do we create these partnerships with maybe schools that don't have those external uh, rotations? Or how do we get them this practical experience that they can really just translate into their practice afterwards? As opposed to, you know, it's like we said earlier, these inner professional education sessions, these cases are super important. Um, but those also take a lot of time, takes a month of work. So how do we balance that? And how do you actually reach out? And, and, and have you seen models where they've like, how do you create those relationships? Well, I think this may be an unusual situation where dental education might be a little bit of he ahead of practice. You know that over time we've been uh, critiqued of being behind practice trends, whether it's in technology or implantology or whatever it might be. We may be a little ahead of the curve in terms of practice. And uh, so I think a challenge is to find these um, reinforcing experiences later in the curriculum, uh, during the clinical training of our, of our students, uh, where um, we can reinforce some of the concepts from the IPE um, experience. Um, you, I think you, as the, the dentists here know that um, in, many in many cases, role, our role models are the clinical faculty. And uh, I don't know if we engage them enough. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, if, if they become the champions, there's, there's, there's undoubtedly a hidden curriculum component here. And I think we have to move, we have to address that and get more of our clinical faculty, more of our clinical leaders involved in uh, uh, not just IPE, but interprofessional care. So some of this rests with us as, uh, in our own clinical uh, intramural activities, which are still a large part of our clinical activities, but also finding community partners and those organizations and practices external that actually practice what we preach, so to speak, in terms of uh, um, interprofessional collaborative care. Thank you for that. Uh, and I know that Dr. Harbin has, has some thoughts about this and how we can keep faculty accountable because I know I practice in our faculty group practice and am participating in a learning collaborative right now where we're trying to increase blood pressure screenings. And uh, on the surface, you would say, well, we're already, we're already doing that. But you know, there, there's, there's nothing to be improved there. But I'll, I'll be very frank and Maybe this is throwing me under the bus a little bit, but things get hectic in the clinic. Um, and that blood pressure screening can get lost in the mix of things when you're trying to see patients every 45 minutes or hygiene checks in between. And so getting um, the whole team involved, my dental assistant now is on board and we're keeping each other accountable. So thank you for bringing that up. That's, that's really critical in terms of our clinical faculty. Um, so I wanted to uh, jump in with uh, Dr. Harvan here and, and get some perspective from um, local and national initiatives and IPE programs, um, but also kind of just seeing, I wanted to pose this question to you, uh, with all these barriers in place, what is the secret sauce to successful and sustainable IPE? And can you give an example? <laughs> yes, and I can give a name to it. It's Fra Diablo which in Italian does mean within the devil. 
Um, so yes, um, the, the years that I have been involved with interprofessional education, it is really important to recognize that the devil is in the details, but at the same time, um, there are definitely enlightened angels out there who have been doing this work for a really long time and have, um, just as you know, Dr. Fauci has said during this pandemic, um, science is iterative and evolving, and the science of, of team-based practice is the same. So the training for uh, team-based practice is the same, and that science is iterative and evolving and has been evolving for decades, um, for many decades, um, going back to the 70s when we had the Institute of Medicine report on the healthcare team. Um, Ed Pellegrino, who was the uh, Dean of um, the School of Medicine at Georgetown, chaired that committee. Um, I was a student then uh, in health sciences, clinical laboratory sciences, and took a course on interdisciplinary teams in the 1970s. So, so yeah, um, and that was our textbook, and it, we did case studies um, in, in, that, in uh, that program. Um, and, and over the years, there have been um, those who have been pioneering and, and contributing to uh, the uh, art and science uh, of the work. So it really is important to recognize that it is iterative and evolving and to tap into that. Uh, what we've done at SIPCO, um, as you know, Tian, with our, our um, evaluation methodology, in particular, is, is I think two um, important lessons learned um, throughout my career, certainly, and then in helping to, to lead the evaluation research um, with CIPCO, CIPCO, is systems theory and the theory of change based on systems theory as being that grounding for us. Because it it is a system, right? We're looking at systems. We're looking at healthcare systems and educational systems. Um, we're also then involved in change. So what is our theory of change based on systems? What are those inputs? What are those outcomes? What are those processes? And how might we be able to then um, think in what educational uh, specialists and educational scientists call backward design, starting with our outcomes. We start with our outcomes first. And in that secret sauce is when we look at what, our, what we're trying to impact, what we're trying to, um, to have as our outcomes, the backward design then brings us to what those processes might be to achieve those outcomes. And then of course, what would be the inputs that would be necessary? And we're looking at context inputs, very contextual within the environments that we work. The ecosystem for interprofessional education is part of that context in thinking about who our stakeholders are. And yes, our clinical partners, our affiliates when our students are going into clinical rotations are extremely important in that, um, in that partnership. So the academic community partnerships. For those um, academic health centers uh, that may have an AHEC system, the Area Health Education Center system, being a part of it, we've been doing this work for a long time. I directed the Colorado AHEC system. Barbara Brandt directed the Minnesota uh, Colorado AHEC system while we were also working in interprofessional. What was that purpose? we realized how important it was not only to do the didactic case-based learning um, interprofessionally, but also to do the simulation um, type of learning. But that's car trying to carve out time right in the curriculum. What about those clinical rotations? And how can we find out throughout, and my work was throughout the state of, of Colorado and looking for where were those sites that our students were going to from across the different professions who might be able to work together in those clinical settings, but not only the clinical settings. We had students doing service learning as well, community service learning as well within the communities. And what was their focus? Health outcomes, health. They themselves were the health promoters and health educators as well. And they were working on workforce development and talking about workforce. Um, issues as well. So there are many different ways 
to be able to address this. And um, I'm gonna put a plug in for um, the National Center for Interprofessional Education and Practice. Uh, that would be nexusipe.org that you would go to. Then if you were to go to that website, in particular, if you were to go to where um, on that website is accelerating, um, there's um, some very important work that is still advancing the science um, here, where um, I think we've seen some um, examples and, and demonstrations uh, across those who have participated in that work of what are the success traits. And the critical success factors for uh, interprofessional education is bottom-up leadership and interprofessional education champions. And we saw that, right, Tian? We saw that with, uh, with uh, not only the research we've done with SIPCO, how important champions were in doing the evaluation research um, that we were doing, but also to, to, to see now um, that's led to the work that we're doing with our, um, our, our Million um, Mouths campaign and the, currently the six um, state champions um, that are part of that. So we've identified six state champions from um, Alabama, Delaware, Tennessee, Hawaii, um, Iowa, and Missouri. Um, to, to initially work as champions. And then we're gonna move that on to um, hopefully over the next 10 years, all 50 states. Top-down leadership is what is also critical um, to, um, to, to the secret sauce, right? Getting your senior leaders uh, who set the tone at the top and the bottom leadership, those champions being able to lead up as well as lead down. Showcasing and resourcing IPE, devoting time, devoting money, devoting recognition, uh, very important with regards to reward and incentive and recognition, uh, time devoted to IPE for your champions and thinking about ways with which to do that. And yes, within the systems that we have, you know, there were ways, um, for example, when I was working at the University of Colorado, we were building that into um, the, um, the appointments and promotion process as well. So um, our strategic planning process as well. And that becomes then the, 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 the next point of success, a commitment to a culture of health, not just healthcare, but a culture of health, right? So that commitment to improving health outcomes um, is very, very important as well. So that our students are not just devoted to their roles as healthcare providers, but in contribution to this culture of, of health and wellness as well. And what has to be a part of um, critical success is a succinct and compelling vision. Very important to be able to have that succinct, compelling vision, and then that backwards design of um, then um, the, the change theory, the theory of change for achieving that compelling vision for what healthcare would look like and how we're preparing our, our students for that. And very important to engage our stakeholders and those are our clinical educators in being a part of that. And I love that approach of outcomes-based um, curriculum. And, and if you, with our research, we found that there is a lot of engagement in a professional education, but the evaluation isn't there. So that kind of shows that it's a little bit backwards there. Um, I'm curious, Dr. Murkowski, if, do you have an evaluation tool for those interprofessional sessions that you're doing? Um, and I know there's a lot of programs that are doing reflective essays after this, um, but I'm curious from, from your program. When we first started out, we actually did research on it to see how um, how effective we were being. So we had um, feedback, feedback from the volunteers, feedback from the standardized patients, as well as peer observers. Um, we also incorporated questions on our exams to see if their attainment of knowledge um, helped with that as well. So those were those were our touch points in um, looking at the effectiveness of our model. As of right now, um, I'm doing mostly just exam questions 
and looking, making sure that the content is um, transferring. But again, that's not about the interpersonal experience. It's more about the content. Great, thank you for that. And, and I know um, pre-pandemic, it was already really challenging, but then the pandemic happened and it, it caused um, a lot of um, uh, changes in, in education. And so I know one barrier that um, occurs in interprofessional education is finding the physical space and carving out that schedule in everyone when you have different schedules, different curricula, different syllabi. Um, and so how were you able to find that physical space? And then how did you have to shift gears once we actually weren't able to be in the same space? So yeah, so that was really challenging. I, for a, we usually did the interprofessional experience in February and I had to secure the space in the summer to make sure that I had the, um, the rooms that I needed for it. I needed two debrief rooms and three simulation um, rooms. And, um, and then getting the volunteers um, and making sure that I, I had the, the number of volunteers I needed for the simulation um, started in the fall with a reminder. Here's, here's when we're doing it. Here's the date and time. Is there any chance that they're still available? And if not, who do you know? <laughs> and then I would go down the tree until about February when I'd finally get my final numbers. Um, so the, the location also was, it was difficult because I needed to make sure people could travel. A lot of times I had the students became a really big challenge because if they weren't local in Boston, even if they were local in Boston, it could take them 45 minutes to get to campus, never mind find parking or taking transportation. And they also had a full class and it wasn't necessarily integrated with their curriculum. So they were doing it on their time. All of those became really big challenges um, mm -hmm. to schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dedicated time is, is certainly a, a, a factor of success, but it isn't always easy to be able to carve out dedicated time in the curriculum for doing these kinds of activities. And I think what's really important is also to understand the developmental psychology of any competencies, right? We wanna be competency-based and that's developmental. So, so there may be some early um, experiences, those one hour, two hour types of experiences. Are you gonna get you know, the bang for the buck, so to speak, with all of the, the value um, that goes into the time, the resources? Uh, that goes into that, well, that's where you're getting the, you know, the ugliness of saying, is, is there, is there a, um, you know, is, is it worth it? But what you need to be able to think about then is how you are developing those competencies over time. So it's not just those, how is it being integrated throughout the curriculum for the purpose of, right? It's not just with, you know, two or more professions learning with, about, and from each other, but in order to improve collaboration and enhance collaboration to improve health outcomes. So we need to be able to move that, um, that, that pointer, if you would, along the way um, so that we are giving more and more exposure, more and more immersion experiences and once they are in their clinical rotations, we're working with our clinical partners on, and you'll see where the exemplars are, where they have dedicated educational units devoted to team-based care. And students are, do we have that at MGH, for example? And we have students who are uh, you know, rotating through in hospitals. We do have um, community health centers, which are those hallmarks of integrated care that Monty spoke with, uh, spoke about as well nationally, so that we can be looking at where our students might be going on their rotations. And then how do we collect that kind of data? They're doing portfolio types of ways of assessment and ways with which students can, just as they do in residency education, do um, their reflecting um, experiences uh, in seminars um, that they would be able to uh, reflect and um, and, and um, consider how they are um, applying uh, interprofessional collaborative um, uh, diagnosis and treatment strategies together uh, and how they are then enhancing outcomes by looking at the patient's outcomes, right, as, as we go along as well. And then bringing in population health. I think we're gonna see a lot more um, movement as we even become more digital. 
so that we're seeing, for example, blockchain and, and the uh, electronic health record um, kind of moving the needle as well so that we can maybe share the electronic health record with blockchain, um, for example, um, that we might be able to, um, to have more uh, opportunities as we did with, with virtual, with home healthcare of getting together and actually reaching out into the, uh, with, with precision medicine and personalized um, healthcare, um, we would be seeing more of that. So, you know, I'm just gonna add, kind of uh, transition then by adding to, you know, experience that I had along the way. Um, yes, the IPAC competencies are um, 10 years since 2011, revised in 2016. IPEC standing for those who might be new to this, um, the um, Interprofessional Education Collaborative of Health Professional Organizations across the country that came together um, for the purposes of um, advancing interprofessional education. And then HPAC, which is the health, um, the health Professions Accrediting um, Consortium of all of the accreditors. And there's about 26, I think, to 29 maybe now, um, who have been involved as well in bringing accreditation. I go back to the work that I was doing, for example, in 2003 with the Institute of Medicine and the Bridge to Quality Report, which was Health Professions Education, a Bridge to Quality. Healthcare teams, inter interdisciplinary, you called them then, um, healthcare teams at the center, but focused on health systems right, and evidence-based approaches, patient-centered care, and engaging with, with patients and having patients being part of the team as well in that patient engagement. You know, uh, the informatics being a part of that as well, and of course, patient safety and quality. So that we're, we need to also think about the content as well as the competencies. And that's, you know, that's where it's non-prescriptive like accreditation is. We tend to do reductionist thinking, right, in, 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 as educators, and that's psychology that we do. And with reductionism, creating all these little courses for developing then proficiency um, and, and um, units of instruction, et cetera. Well, we did the same with IPE. We took that center that with the um, IOM report came up with on healthcare teams and we have the four competencies, the IPEC competencies. And now we're beginning to evolve more with engaging um, in, the, in, in the nexus. Yeah. And that nexus is that space between connecting those networks of networks connecting education and practice. Yeah, that perspective and how is- do we work in that space? Yeah, that perspective is fantastic. I, I think that the silver lining of the pandemic is that we've, we've become more virtual and we've also been forced to be more innovative. Um, and so I wanted to put out the poll here um, um, to you all. Let's see here. Do you think of virtual IPE sessions will be the golden ticket in ensuring future success of IPE. You know, it's not the only solution, but um, it's one thing that potentially could overcome that, that physical space challenge that Dr. Markowski was talking about. Um, and we'll give a couple more seconds for the group to respond. And I know that Dr. Markowski had to pivot um, and so I'll ask her about that. And also Dr. McNeil, I will ask you also about how students can also pivot in, in their entering practice to maybe demand a little bit more of that exposure to interprofessional practice. Um, so we can end this poll here and I will share the results. So yeah, a lot of you do you believe that, that the IP virtual sessions can be that golden ticket in ensuring this future success? Um, so Dr. Markowski, uh, how have you pivoted um, given the pandemic? Yeah, so it, it, was, it was actually one of those you know, pleasant surprises as you have to sit back and kind of recreate yourself and figure out what is the real goal that you needed to do. Um, here I now had a Zoom platform, this wonderful, um, technology that I hadn't really been using before that had these great breakout rooms and different stuff that I can do. 
So I was, um, I was actually able to, um, again, with the help of Dr. Lenny Brennan, um, reach out to Nancy Foster from University of Maine, who um, is a program director for the hygienist program there. They've got 18 hygienists in. We also had um, one of the dental schools on board, hopefully, to kind of join us as well. And I actually created um, very quickly um, a very different interprofessional, actually even think much better, to be honest, um, experience where I had to look at it and say, well, this is great for my PT students, but how am I attracting the dental students and the hygienist students? Like, there's nothing. I got to give them something back. They can't just be supporting us. And um, I actually created a headache case. Um, as one case. And then I had two other cases that were kind of, one was preventative and one was pathology based on your oral health screening. And we um, put everybody into breakout rooms. And I had one um, dental professional in a breakout room with each of um, our students. My numbers weren't great. I wish I had more dental students and, and providers, but um, things came up. It wasn't part of their curriculum because it was a last minute thing. So they were volunteering their time. I think in retrospect, we've talked that if we embed it into everybody's curriculum, then we have a set time and a set purpose for it. Um, so we had a online one hour, took me probably 15 hours to set up versus my two months. Um, I created a, a full um, uh, script, really. I had a whole script. So if I didn't have a professor in the room with my 18 groups, it would still run, it would run well. And so I had a moderator that was one of the PT students who made sure the conversation continued and I gave them talking points. I had a person who was a patient and um, I gave them all the answers to the cases. And then we had the other groups working together in a conversation. And it, um, we had a demonstration of an oral health by the PT students, which then the, the dental professionals were able to give feedback. And this is what we look at. We might've done it a little bit different. Um, then we talked about, you know, how you have those difficult conversations with if there's somebody had a pathology that possibly, you know, might have been oral cancer, you know, how do you, how do you have that conversation? How do you make sure that the patient follows up? And um, the response was fantastic. And then this great conversation about headaches and different ways that you look at headaches from, from a TMJ standpoint and to have, you know, the, um, dental students or the dental professionals talking about occlusion therapy. My students had heard of it, but they really just didn't get it. And they're like, wait, you guys work with the TMJ. And so it was, it was a really exciting and I popped in and out of them. And then we brought everybody together for a debrief at the end. Um, and I was so excited. I was so excited about how that worked. I thought I've just decreased significantly the workload that goes with it, um, but improved the learning experience and the take home message. And um, it was thrown together last minute. I collected nothing on it. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. next year. Next year, yeah. uh, we're going, we've got a lot of areas that we can work on, but I was so excited on how that went. That's a, I, can, I can read it in your face too. And that's <laughs> yeah. so exciting. Um, and I know that um, lots of schools have had to shift in, in, in a similar way. Um, I wanna move us also to, as we're thinking about those outcomes, Dr. McNeil, you know, our, if we're doing these great and we're moving mountains to create these spaces where students can, can practice in this way, but then when they leave, if, if they don't have that opportunity to practice in those practices that you found in your study, you know, as a junior dentist, how do you go into a practice and say, hey, can, can I bring the social worker in? Or how do, how do you try to integrate when it's not set up for you? And how do we encourage students that they can continue this work, this important work when they're in practice? Yeah, a great question. And I think this really, to agree with Robin, uh, this is an evolution. Um, it's going to take many years to move through uh, systems change. I think one great thing we are doing is talking to our students about health systems and understanding that perhaps those systems aren't perfect, and especially in our dental care system is rather remote from uh, a large part of the medical care system. So I think really I'm less uh, critical of our IPE experiences. I think where the biggest challenge is, is providing those reinforcing experiences. Um, in, our, in the next phase, phase two, in, in the care of our, our patients. Um, and I don't think we can rely exclusively on the community or, or external uh, entities. They're a big part 
but uh, we're trying to encourage our own academic institutions, especially those in academic health centers, to develop what we call slices, slices of collaboration across those academic health centers. Sometimes perhaps we try to do too much, um, but whether it's in screening of common diseases like prediabetes, diabetes, or cardiovascular issues, mm -hmm. or co-management, whatever it may be, the more we can do it in our own systems to show students that those things they have been taught, perhaps in theory, perhaps in theory remotely, actually can be applied in practice. The question you ask is, is phase three. Now in practice, how do our, our graduates influence practice? And that's a, that's a long-term uh, uh, question, but I think they can. Uh, those we, we tell our students, they are the future leaders of the profession. And I think if they can leave our, our educational programs with that idea, that they've seen some of this in action. They can actually, they've actually seen how it works. Uh, they actually saw how it worked. And perhaps a slice, perhaps not in the total clinical curriculum, but in a slice of it. Uh, I think that our, those new leaders can influence uh, yes. practice long-term. Yes, and that's one of the collaborations that we're doing now with um, MCPHS and Harvard is advocacy and action in uh, interprofessional education in the community in Mission Hill. Um, and Mission Hill is a um, underserved area in the Boston community. So we're just in the very beginning stages of planning how students would be working together in teams and going into the community to the health centers in the community as well as to the other nonprofits in the community um, for those purposes. But just like um, Alicia, MCPHS um, has seen the silver linings of doing um, IPE online. Um, and, um, and, and we've also seen, even though we don't have uh, the Longwood Medical Center, um, I want to, to, to stress as well to those of you who aren't in, in academic health centers, for example, Harvard has a medical school and a dental school, but doesn't have its own nursing school and it doesn't have you know, its own physical therapy program. So who do they partner with? Us, right? So they bring us into to the partnerships. And similarly with pharmacy, pharmacy, for example, has the accreditation standard of, of being able to work with, um, with uh, medical students. So we work with Tufts, we work with, with Harvard medical students in doing um, interprofessional education. Um, and it's wonderful that you can do so with the hospitals as well. We did do a, um, uh, a virtual case uh, discharge planning um, with Children's Hospital. And it was wonderful to have Children's Hospital um, um, work with us on a, a case of discharge planning where 400 students from across um, the Harvard Medical School, some dental students were part of that. Um, as well as, as our students at uh, MCPHS in working through that case um, in, in discharge planning for a pediatric patient. So many different, different uh, opportunities um, have opened up um, with regards to doing, uh, to doing virtual work as well, as well as opportunities to be able to have community engagement. Um, and, um, and having our, our, our students working together in the communities as well. Well, absolutely. And, and I think also um, the maybe hidden outcome of these interprofessional education sessions is that I, you know, the graduates may now remember that student that they worked with that was in another profession and have their email address and reach out if they have a difficult um, health issue that they're trying to pursue and figure out and diagnose. And now I can reach out to like, for example, for me, I can reach out to Dr. Markowski now if I have a question, yes. right? And, and those are those connections that they continue. You know, I went to school with medical students uh, during my dental training, and I have my medical colleagues that I reach out to now when I want a quick an uh, answer, perhaps when I can't reach the primary care physician of my patient, because it takes days to actually connect. Um, yeah. And so these are the, you know, in the world of social media and internet being so quick in connection, sometimes yeah. having yeah. that one person that you could reach out to, even if you're in a clinical practice Absolutely. that that isn't encouraging in a professional education. Absolutely, so networks, and we are a community of practice, right? So uh, it's an interprofessional community of practice that we're all engaged with and, and just being part of that network is really um, helpful. And in that community of practice, as I, again, I say that nexus is so critical between, um, between practice and education. 
um, after I left the University of Colorado, I'm thinking, Alicia, of the work that I did at Walter Reed, um, in which we were working with TBI and PTSD um, and creating an interprofessional model of care. And then I was working as um, acting director of education and training to train the team to do that. So PT was really important, obviously, for TMJ. Um, but also, um, you know, some of the other um, uh, maxillofacial issues with regards to how audiology and um, maxillofacial kind of connect as well. Um, so that we were doing more um, interprofessional there. Occupational therapy was very much a part of bruxism and, 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 and working on hygiene as well with the activities of daily living. Um, so yes, we were integrating oral health and um, and and uh, primary care, but integrating many of the different professions with regards to that. So so we can see those exemplars, for example, in the military health system and the VA, um, uh, quite quite a bit. They're doing a lot of work with this blockchain um, shared electronic record as well. Uh, so you know there are those exemplars, and yeah. um, and and that's they're in the network. So reaching out to them is, is, makes a lot of sense, is just to be able to reach out. And we hope we'll, you'll reach out to us too, all of, the, of you who are with us here today, um, because that expands our community of practice. Yeah, so as so I um, recognize the time here and I have a couple acknowledgements to make, um, but before we do that, I don't know if uh, Dr. McNeil, you have kind of a wish, wish for the future um, in overcoming these devil in the details uh, in IPE. Oh, you're on mute. I think we're in this evolutionary period uh, where we do need to develop these reinforcing clinical experiences for our, our students, whether that's moving the IPE, the early IPE experiences closer or just building uh, beyond them. The other, the other, um, if you want, the ugly three letters are, are EHR, electronic health record. <laughs> we need to address that. Um, Robin, you mentioned it as, as a, as a linking uh, uh, opportunity uh, in, in dental medicine. We need to address it. We need to address it in our academic institutions. Yes. And I would just put a challenge to our leaders in, of um, of uh, academic institutions within, especially within academic health centers with multiple um, health programs uh, to, uh, to develop uh, these, uh, these programs, these collaborative programs, uh, wherever they may be best suited. Uh, and then as we continue to work on, on, on the communication, on the language uh, barrier that our electronic health records pose right now. Thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Markowski, if you have a few words as well. Uh, I, I feel invigorated. I feel like that I've turned, turned a point in IPE personally. I don't have that conversation anymore. Is it worth it? I, I really feel like I've, um, there's some different, different ways to look at it outside the box. And I do feel that the, the virtual platform has, has opened up that for me. I think there's a lot of improving to do as far as just the in-classroom experience and building upon that and getting the best um, collaborators that I can possibly and expanding mm -hmm. that. Um, and I've you know got a lot of great ideas about that, but I do, I feel like I've turned a corner with it. That is very inspiring. Thank you. Um, Dr. Harvin, just a, a few thoughts to, to close out. I know you're writing a memoir. Do you yeah, I'm writing this, my memoir. <laughs> uh, yeah, what are, what are your, um, I know you, you know, I, it, it, obviously for spending, um, you know, 40 years, it'll be 40 years um, of, of my career. Um, 1982 was my, was where I started as a professor, uh, assistant professor, uh, and was focused on interprofessional um, education in, at the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. Um, and then moved on from there. So it, this is a long career of, 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 of work. Um, and as I said, yes, um, believe me, the, yes, Fra Diablo, the devil is in the details, but those details are really uh, so important in creating systems change 
And that's what we're all about. We want to we want to continue to improve systems. That's what quality improvement is, right? Continuous improvement. And I'm an evaluator. So as an evaluator as well, it's it's important to be able to have that vision, have and that compelling vision has those measurable outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, and we think about the role of our disciplines of dentistry, of physical therapy, of of any of the professions um, and what their roles are in, contr in contributing to healthcare outcomes and how collaboration then helps to enhance those outcomes. What we need to be able to do are more of those demonstrations, right? Where we are linking then health outcomes and that's the TISH, so I'm gonna um, talk about our TISH, which is teaming and integrating for Smiles for Health program, in which we are um, partnering academic community partnerships with community health centers, and um, and for the purpose of teaming um, and uh, and and finding those opportunities for um, for practice and education um, to be able to work collaboratively in enhancing uh, integration and in improving health outcomes. Thank you for that. And so I do want to acknowledge, speaking of teaming, uh, we would not be able to do the work at SIPCO or the initiative without our collaborators at SIPCO, um, the, from the institutions and the individuals. And uh, we've talked a lot about resources and, and people who are along the whole spectrum of interprofessional education. And we launched our resource library just last month in April. Um, and this is the link here where you can see all the different integration stakeholders that you may wanna reach out to or you're already working with and how can you build that community of practice. Uh, and um, also the uh, toolkits and guides, maybe it's some of some things that you could use to implement so you don't feel like you are reinventing the wheel. It's something that you could tailor to your organization. Um, a list of publications and also media where our webinars will be posted on there and in addition to other webinars and media pieces um, around integration. And then in that optimism and excitement that Dr. Markowski was leaving us with, uh, we have our next webinar, it'll be coming this summer, and we'll be diving a little bit more into our 100 million mouse campaign, where you know you as a as all three of you as champions are really helping to move the needle in interprofessional education. And um, I know someone in the Q&A asked who those champions were, those six. Um, you can go to this page here um, from our SIPCO website, you can see at the bottom of the slide uh, where you can learn a little bit more about who those six are right now and what, what their background is, where they're representing. And, um, and we're going to hopefully grow this in the years to come. So with that, I wanted to thank all of um, the panelists here, Dr. Markowski, Dr. Harvin, and Dr. McNeil for your um, really candid discussion about this topic and from everywhere from um, a couple decades ago to present day. So that really, I think for me at least, leaves me on a, a very positive note. So with that, I thank you all and look forward to seeing you all in future webinars. Thank you.